Hello and welcome back to the Stronger Than Steel podcast. My name is John Keir and with me as always is Austin Davidson. Hello. Uh, today is uh, season one, episode nine. We're recapping the Steelers week, what is it, week 13? Uh, I believe so. Yes, it was week 13. The Steelers 24-14 to victory over the New York Giants. The Steelers bookended their NFC schedule on Sunday with wins over the Washington Redskins on opening night uh, back in week one and wins over the Giants this week. They also lost two games against the Eagles and Cowboys in the middle of the season. Uh, just some quick takeaways I wanted to cover real quickly. Uh, Javon Hargrave, defensive lineman, and Shamarco Thomas, safety, have both left uh, the game with concussions. Uh, both are impactful losses, uh, particularly Hargrave on the defensive line, one that, a group that's already missing Cameron Hayward. Uh, Shamarco Thomas is uh, an exclusive special teams player, but he is good at what he does. So we're hoping both of them can return quickly. Um, one other thing I wanted to talk about really quickly is uh, Randy Bullock. I think he played really well, considering the fact he was signed a day earlier, don't you think? Oh, he did all we needed from him. He was the team leading scorer of the day, so I think he did great. Uh, this was uh, the final score read 24-14, to but the Steelers led pretty much the entire way and uh they were up uh by a somewhat comfortable score most of this game would you give this game by the Steelers was it an excellent game a good game or was it an above average game like their performance wise what do you think I think it rounds out at uh good but uh defensively and offensively it was excellent but uh special teams just continues to be really below average. It's really bad. that they're, they're not doing well at all, so they're really pulling the rest of the team down. I mean, it's not the biggest part of the team, which is why it's still more towards a good good win, but special teams is really, really disappointing. What, uh, you, what do you think? What do you, what do you mean with special teams? Why uh, Randy Bullock was perfect yesterday. What's, uh, what's wrong with the uh, special teams? While Randy Bullock was perfect, the rest of the Steelers special teams continues to rack up unnecessary penalties. I see that a lot. It's just really bad. There's also, like, no return game. We, we Our longest return, I believe, was Toussaint against, I believe, Cleveland. And it was, it was only, like, 33 yards. It's just non-existent. Also, Jordan Barry didn't have that great of a day. He punted four times for an average of 37 yards, which is... It's weird for him being under 40. He's been doing really good all this uh, all season, and being under 40 was a bit disappointing. I'll, um, I'm going to give Barry a little bit of a pass on this one simply because two of his four punts were downed inside the 20. I, if I'm remembering correctly, which I might not be, I think most of those punts came around midfield, so he, he was kind of dealing with the short field anyways. Um, but I get where you're sure. coming from. As far as the penalties go... That's that's been a huge problem that we've been seeing for weeks now. Uh, it's been affecting all sides of the the ball, particularly uh, special teams. It felt like every play it wasn't just the Steelers. It felt like every play that there was a penalty on uh, special teams, but mostly the Steelers. And there were definitely some penalties early on. Did you, you did you watch this game from start to finish, or did, you had work, didn't you? Yeah, I had work. I had to listen to part of it, and I, I missed some because I didn't even know Le'Veon Bell threw a pass until later on. <laughs> yeah, I was confused at the time if that was a designed play or if Bell like, just realized that he was going to get tackled behind the line, so he just kind of smartly threw it out of bounds. But based on what I when I watched it again, Eli Rogers was wide open on the other side of the field, but there was, wasn't really a reason Bell would should have seen him considering he's not a quarterback. Um where was I before? Um, oh, yeah, the penalties. Uh, early on in this game, watching, it really felt like this was going to be one of those games where the Steelers could have scored a lot more. I think it was 5 nothing after the first quarter. It was definitely 5 nothing, And you could just tell that, like, on the Steelers' first drive, they had two penalties and two drops. And it just felt like it was going to be that kind of game where they were moving the ball, but they were going to find a way to shoot themselves in the foot to not get enough points. 
and it really looked like that was the way it was going to be, but uh, with the Steelers facing yet another goal line situation, Lawrence Timmons intercepts Eli Manning and returns it. I think it was something like 60 yards. It really felt like we were looking at a young Lawrence Timmons on that play. You didn't get a chance to see that, did you? I actually watched the replay because I was, I was so happy. As soon as I heard Lawrence Timmons got an interception, because that was my bold prediction, that was one of them, I was like, oh, but yeah. So I, I went back and watched it, and it was pretty impressive. I was really impressed because he's not a man known for his speed. And he brought it back pretty far. <laughs> yeah, it's certainly not at this point in his career. It felt like we were watching Lawrence Timmons of, like, 2010. All of a sudden, he was running past Ryan Chazier. So that was nice uh, to see. That play definitely changed the game because the Steelers were looking at what would have become a 7-5 to deficit had they given up a score, assuming the Giants made the extra point and didn't go for two. But the Steelers really buckled down thereafter, especially defensively. Uh, they only finished with two sacks, but they were getting consistent pressure throughout the game, and the Steelers' lead allowed them to sort of play the Giants one-dimensional as the Giants really all, already struggle rushing the ball. But when a team is one-dimensional, I always believe it's a lot easier to stop a team. I mean, not always, but the defense really has come together over the last few weeks, and this was supposed to be a big test, at least through the air, and... You know, I don't know if you could expect the Steelers to stop Odell Beckham Jr. because he's such a great player, but I think you aren't going to find much more of a quiet 10 catches for 100 yards. Uh, what do you think about that? I wouldn't expect Chris Harris Jr. I wouldn't expect, expect Akeem Tlaib. I wouldn't expect Josh Norman. I wouldn't expect Desmond Trufant. To, all of them to keep Odell Beckham Richard quiet. Sherman. So I completely agree that those 10 catches or 100 yards were pretty quiet. Keeping him out of the end zone was a small victory for me. So I was just happy with that. So I, I agree. What uh, I'm sorry, but what, what about Richard Sherman? Uh, I, I was just naming ones off the top of my head. I'm sorry, Richard Sherman, for disrespecting you like that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm sure he's, he's going to hear this uh, tomorrow, and he's going to be really upset. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, I mean, actually, that was a good thing. I left I left him off of a list of people who would get beat by Odell Beckham. So, yeah. Nah, he would totally beat by Odell Beckham. <laughs> but anyways, uh, looking at the Giants receiving core, it looked like it was going to be a three-headed monster, but I don't know why they just didn't get Victor Cruz in the game. I'm pretty sure he was held off the stat sheet looking at uh, – yeah, he had nope. n- not even a single target. It was mostly OBJ. He did not have a target. He had a f- they, they cut off one of those heads, man. <laughs> I, I really don't get that. Um, they had Sterling Shepard was pretty quiet himself. He had one of the two touchdowns. Rashad Jennings had the other on a screen pass. Really, the, the Steelers just, you know, part of it's because the Giants didn't have the ball much in this game. They had the ball for just under 26 minutes. But the Steelers were getting off the field too. They were, uh, f- the Giants were four of eleven on third down and zero for three on fourth down. So really, the, they just they just never got in a rhythm until late when the Steelers were well in hand. Uh, when the uh, final of this game was well in hand, um, you know it's really interesting. I wasn't expecting this kind of good performance, particularly the pressure on Eli Manning that came later. As I I remember we had discussed particularly. Uh, from my perspective, I was thinking the Steelers would do better to not rush Manning and play coverage against him, but they actually played better when they brought the blitz and, and uh, they disrupted him a little bit. They definitely took him off his game. And shout out to Ricardo Matthews for getting a sack, man. I mean, there was a whole bunch of Steelers in the area and he was just credited with it, but he, he went down on paper having it. So. Wow. Yeah, nice for him. He. He might have to step up in a big way uh, against Buffalo next week, but we'll we'll get to that later. Um, what else? We've been talking mostly about the defense. Oh, yeah. Um, geez. Uh, Sean Davis also got his first career interception. Yeah, it was on a fourth down. He probably could have knocked it uh, down or whatever, but it's nice to see him playing well. And I think the last few weeks, granted, two, two weeks have been against bad teams and quarterbacks, but... I think Mike Mitchell could be playing his best Steelers football right now the last few weeks. He's been a physical presence, and 
his coverage has been pretty good considering it it's been spotty at, at best uh in uh most of his Steelers career prior to the last few weeks. Don't you think so? Uh in the game, uh he only made one mistake and that I was in it. it was at the end of the game when the game was basically already over. It was it was over for the Giants. He he got a holding or pass interference, I think it was pass interference, uh in the end zone which let them to get the, the next score, but uh, overall, Mike Mitchell is – this is the Mike Mitchell we wanted to see. After all the shitting on him in the beginning of the year, all the, the things we said about him, he's he's really shaping up. I've liked the hits he's put on. He's actually making tackles. He, uh, he, he was covering OBJ for a little bit, helping with uh, uh, Ross Cockrell when he was shadowing. And I like what I was seeing. I like what uh, Mike Mitchell's been doing over the past few weeks. He's definitely improved his game. Absolutely, and uh, we'll get to Artie Burns and Ross Cockrell later and how they played against uh, Odell Beckham Jr., but now I want to shift to the offense. Uh, Early on, this game was a mostly Le'Veon Bell offense, as it has been the last few weeks, relying heavily on the run, which I wasn't expecting, but the Steelers were getting uh, some contributions through the air from other players not named Brown, uh, specifically Ladarius Green. Uh, Ladarius Green was absolutely the breakout player for the Steelers on Sunday. He had his first career 100-yard receiving game and his first career Steelers touchdown. He only caught six passes, but it was clear that he was a matchup nightmare for the Giants. They had no answer for him. And that allowed Le'Veon Bell to get some more room through the middle on the ground as the game went on. And it just felt like the offensive line was getting better uh, um, as far as run blocking went. And uh, Antonio Brown had a quiet day, six catches for, I think it was 54 yards. No, 64 yards, my bad. Or, yeah, it was 54 yards. Uh, no, you were 54, yeah. But he had two fantastic highlight reel catches, one where he toe-tapped it to keep his feet in bounds, and the other was a fantastic vintage Roethlisberger to Brown touchdown uh, on Janoris Jenkins. So, Maybe not the best day for the offense, but I realized as I was watching this game that the Giants have a statistically average defense, but it's it's a pretty, I'd say a pretty good defense, don't you think? Uh, I I thought really highly of them for who they have. I thought really highly of their defensive line, which was incredible. As you said, I didn't really expect the rushing attack from Le'Veon Bell and the Steelers. But it happened and it worked. It, it was against, I believe, JPP came out of the game uh, about at the halfway mark. But it was still pretty good. Uh, rushing with Damon Harrison, JPP, Olivier Vernon. Uh, that's a pretty good group of people, I, I would say. And plus they got Landon Co- Collins in the secondary. Well, Landon Collins is a crazy, crazy man. <laughs> that is a man that every team should be scared of. And, I mean, he did have a good day in tackles, but... I think it was. I think it was great what this offense did against these defensive people. Oh, he he. Landon Collins is a, one of the best safeties in the NFL, but he bit so hard on that green, uh, that green touchdown at the uh, at the latter portion of the game. It just he he looked like a rookie again. But uh, overall, I thought the offense did some good things. Le'Veon Bell again was a monster. Ben Roethlisberger had another, I guess, quiet two hundred eighty nine yard performance, if you will. He played almost perfect, minus the interception he threw. I felt like he threw that ball and threw it a little bit behind Eli Rogers. And uh, also, again, we we, we really weren't expecting that much, but if you want to take away Green, Brown, and Bell, the Steelers only got six receptions from other players. That includes Jesse James, Eli Rogers, Kobe Hamilton, and David Johnson, who were all targeted. Uh None of them really made a significant contribution at all. I know Eli, or not Eli, actually, I think Eli Rogers did drop a pass. I know Jesse James dropped an early pass. His play has dropped off lately. I think uh, Eli Rogers actually dropped two. He was targeted three times and only caught one for 18 yards, I believe. Uh, Kobe Hamilton was targeted twice and uh, targeted three times and caught two. Yeah. So, I mean, I wasn't expecting much from them, but I'd like to see a little bit more, especially I'd like to see Eli Rogers targeted a little more. Um, I don't know. Uh, I guess it's it's good enough because they won, but going forward, I'd like to see a little bit more. 
Uh, one last point bef- uh, before we get on, get on to our other talking points. Penalties and drops. We talked about it a little bit earlier. The Steelers were penalized 12 times for 115 yards. Many of these, particularly on early drives, they, they were drive killing, as simple as that. And these drives had been promising, and they could have taken po- and they could have potentially taken points off the board. And drops were definitely a problem early on too. I, as I said earlier, Jesse James didn't play well. Do you pin penalties more on a coaching staff or the players, or do you divide it up equally? What do you What do you think about penalties? That's a hard question for me because my immediate reaction is to to blame it on the coaches, but I think it's more half and half because the coaches aren't just like, okay, we're going to ignore this part of the game. They 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 teach it, they coach it. The players just don't listen. They don't. You, uh, use what they learned effectively, and then they get the penalty. So I'll go half and half, because I don't think the coaching staff is being discipl- disciplinary enough uh, to keep them in check, because it's happening on a ridiculous scale, these penalties. But uh, it's all, it's also the players. You can't just pin on the coaches. Let, what do you think? Let, let me tell you this. As far as classifying penalties, I think it's hard to classify like in-play penalties like, I think David Johnson had a penalty. I think it was a hold. Like, you can understand why these players make, like, holding penalties. Like, they're trying to, if it's in the pass game, they're trying to not let their quarterback get killed. I can understand stuff like that. So maybe you can blame the player for those kinds of penalties, or maybe the official made a bad call for stuff like that. I think you're always going to have those kinds of penalties every now and then. I think the ones that really need to be avoided and can be avoided are pre-snap penalties, like false starts. And the one that annoys me the most, I guess I should break this down. The two types of penalties that annoy me the most are false starts from skill position players like receivers or running backs and illegal formations. I don't know why an illegal formation should ever happen. It should never happen. Right? Like, I mean, I just, like, I mean, maybe they were told to line up a different way, but there's no reason, like, you go over it in practice. There's, you, you gotta, I don't know. I just, that that's mind-boggling to me. As far as uh, false start by skill position players, I remember uh, when I was playing high school football that we were told, or at least the receivers were told, I didn't play receiver, I just remember hearing the coach say this, a receiver should never have a false start penalty because they're looking at the ball, or they should be looking at the ball when the ball is snapped. So they should not They should be going like how the defense is quote-unquote supposed to follow it instead of going by the snap count. And then the running backs, Le'Veon Bell had a second false start penalty in the last three weeks. That's inexcusable. There's really no no two ways about it, so... When it comes to pre-snap penalties like that, those are the things that really, really frustrate me as a fan, and I'm sure frustrate a lot of people <laughs> around around the uh, Steelers too. Hmm. Uh, I bring this back a little bit. Uh, we were going over the wide receiver stat sheet, and you know who wasn't on there for targets at all? Yeah, Sammy Coates. <laughs> Oh, man. Maybe we should have let off with that. Oh, sorry, you go? I said maybe we should have let off with that. Just said we straight straight up dropped the ball on that one. Get it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was... Um, I'm sorry. That was horrible. It was bad. It, he didn't even get a target. Uh, we both had him in high regards. Uh, I think you predicted him having a long, a long reception for possibly a touchdown. I had him for, like... Six receptions for 110 yards, which is, I think, is exactly what Ladarius Green got. But uh, he didn't even show up. He, he wasn't there. And uh, at this point, uh, with with that, uh, I, I give up on him for the year. I, I think it's over. Uh, I, I don't. Even though he might still not be healthy, I, I'm calling it quits now. And it might be for his career because when Martavis Bryant comes back next season. I don't expect to see Sammy Coates. I expect to see Antonio Brown, Eli Rogers, and um, and uh, Martavis Bryant on the outside. Yeah. Uh, I, also, assuming Marcus Wheaton leaves, because Marcus Wheaton could possibly take wide receiver two over Eli Rogers, but I don't see it's that. Not looking like. Um, I have 
I have no idea what to say about that anymore. It's kind of, I'm pretty sure he's healthy because we've seen him out there for returns. We've seen him out there for special teams. If he's not healthy, just don't play him at this point. And if he is, which it seems like he is now, what what are you saving him for? If you're going to, is it like a confidence problem? Is it simply he doesn't know the offense well? It's just if he doesn't know it, don't don't play him, I guess. The Steelers need a deep threat, though, so here's hoping Darius Hayward Bay gets back quickly because we don't have one without him. Because I feel like that's the dynamic the offense is missing if they want to contend for, excuse me, a deep playoff run. Um, so that's all I have to say about that. So real quickly, I wanted to talk about uh, some a few more points. Just real quickly, Ladarius Green, how great was it to see a different type of I guess receiver, maybe a different type of tight end that the Steelers probably haven't seen maybe ever, probably ever in this kind of an offense because Heath Miller wasn't this kind of athlete. I mean, what kind of dynamic does Ladarius Green bring to the Steelers' offense? This was great because after the game, I was looking through statistics, and this not only was this Ladarius Green's first 100-yard game, this was a bigger game than Heath Miller has ever had with Ben Roethlisberger, obviously the only quarterback he's been with. Uh, it, that it's fantastic knowing that someone other than the killer bees can actually do something. Because <laughs> I didn't know it was possible before this week. It seems like we had to either watch as Bell just took the ball the whole time, at, or we had to rely on Brown, like in the Colts game, and or and then Ben delivering it, and then no one else was there. It's like okay, like Jesse James has one catch. Eli Rogers might have two for like ten yards. But seeing Ladarius Green catch six for 110, oh, two were like one was 33 and one was 37, and it was just it was great. I I won't say he was perfect because he was targeted 11 times in total, and he only caught six, so just over 50 percent of passes were caught. But it was just still see, nice to see him get explosive plays. What do you think about Ladarius Green? Absolutely, I agree with every point you made. And on top of what you were saying about the negatives about him, he's also not a very good blocker, but I also wasn't expecting much from him. Just the fact that he can stretch the field up the seam, the fact that he's a big athletic player, makes just the matchup problems alone is such an advantage for the offense that should hopefully free up other players at some point. It's just an extra dynamic that's needed for an offense that's trying to be elite. That's just something that elite offenses have, and it's something that the Steelers have really been missing this season. Basically, if you want to think about, I guess the best comparison I can make is <laughs> Xavier Grimble is is kind of the only other player that could have been something like that, but he's obviously not near the talent level. But Ladarius uh, Green is basically a huge upgrade of the tight end position. He gives something the Steelers have never had. Um, going, did, was there something you wanted to say? Uh, no, you can keep going. Um, so the next point I wanted to talk about was the fact that <laughs> no other receivers seem to have stepped up now, and I guess maybe we're asking for a bit too much because now instead of two receivers, we have three if you want to include Green. But, I mean... <laughs> Who else, who else is going to step up? The Steelers still need that deep threat. I mean, uh, nobody else really contributed. Eli Rogers had one catch for 18 yards, but you want to see more from him. You want to see more from Jesse James. Hopefully a little more from Kobe Hamilton, even though we kind of know what he is. Uh, <laughs> I get, we already kind of touched on it. The Steelers need a deep threat, and if it's not going to be Sammy Coates, it's got to be Darius Hayward Bay, don't you think? Steelers right now are really missing Darius Hayward Bay. I'm missing Darius Hayward Bay. I never thought I would say that because last year I just kind of looked at him as, as like wide receiver four or five. <laughs> he might have been behind Sammy Coates last year. I don't. I I, I don't really know because Sammy Coates got to play a, a lot in the late later games as uh, as the spot opened up for him. But now, now this season Darius Hayward Bay has been pretty good. Uh, in the bad Dolphins game, he was one of the shining stars in that game. Uh, he would have had two touchdowns. Uh, maybe I'm thinking of another game. Uh, but uh, one got called back at late. New England. Uh, I remember. What? The New England game. Oh, okay. That, 
I'm think I'm combining two separate games, but I know he still had a good game against the Dolphins. He had that 66 yard uh, rush yes. against the Dolphins, and then he almost he almost had two touchdowns against the Ravens. And so he's having a pretty good year for or he was until he got injured. Yeah. And uh, Steelers are missing him right now because they want a cheap threat on the outside, and it's not Sammy Coates. <laughs> yeah, even if his you know percentage of catching a ball is 50 50 on whether or not he drops it, it's. The, the ability to stretch out a defense is something the Steelers, on, on the outside at least now, still need. Uh, moving on, uh, Le'Veon Bell has fumbled for, I think, the third time in the last six games after fumbling once in, like, his first three seasons. Is this something to be concerned think... about, or is this, like, a law of averages kind of thing, just catching up, do you think? Uh, I'm going to go with the law of averages. He's been worked really hard this season. A lot of people actually are, are saying that he should uh, slow it down, the coaches should slow it down for him. Uh, I, I like it where it's at, but that's a separate conversation. Uh, I think it's just he's getting the ball a lot more than uh, normal. He's being thrown to at, at a higher rate. He's carrying it at a higher rate. The offense is just relying on him on, a, on an overall higher rate. So, uh while uh, he's fumbled three times, luckily only this was the first one that actually got uh, turned over. Uh, um, but so I wouldn't say it's the biggest problem right now. I would say this is this is okay as long as he keeps it lower on the lower side. Uh, Ezekiel Elliott has fumbled quite a bit so so far in his career, and people are still loving him. And I think Le'Veon Bell still deserves the love with uh, how much he gets the ball. What do you think on the subject? Originally, I was thinking, oh, f- uh, fumbles are my least favorite kind of uh, negative play. I think that I always, f- I guess they can't always be avoided, but I, they're the thing I hate the most, probably because uh, I just, my lasting memory of Super Bowl Forty Five was Richard Mendenhall fumbling and that basically doing in the Steelers in that Super Bowl. Um, you're right, though. The the sheer number of times Le'Veon Bell gets the football, I think it's just three straight games with at least 35 touches now. <laughs> a lot of averages say you're going to fumble at some point. And I think the fumble in, against the Giants this past week, you could have made the argument that the play should have been blown dead sooner, but it wasn't. So I'm not going to be too mad at him for fumbling, even if it's <clears throat> even if it's been several times in the past few weeks. If it happens again... In the next couple of weeks, maybe it's something to be concerned about, but I don't think it's anything to be too concerned about at this point. Lastly, something we need, sorry, go ahead. Sorry. Some, something we need to talk about on that play, though. Kobe Hamilton did not fall on the ball. He was literally right there. He was just he tried grabbing it. He tried picking it up. I don't know what he was doing because Le'Veon Bell was trying to grab it. Le'Veon Bell had the right idea to try and recover his fumble. Then you have Kobe Hamilton right there, like mess, <laughs> almost messing with him. Like trying to pick it up, I'm like I was, I was just screaming, looking at my t- uh, my cell phone, like just fall on it, and then you like, I it. yeah, I don't, I don't really know what he was doing on that play, but I'm sure the coaches are going to give him near full of it this week. Oh yeah. All right, so the last thing I wanted to talk about here before we move on to uh, next week quickly is that the uh, the secondary, uh, the, probably the most maligned unit of this defense over the past two or three years. Is it becoming a strength of this defense? We already talked about Mike Mitchell playing well. But all of a sudden, uh, Artie Burns and Sean Davis, now they both have their first interceptions. Ross Cockrell's played well uh, the last few weeks. Has this secondary turned the corner? Are they now Are they now a strength of this defense? No. <laughs> no. Uh, I, I'm, I'm I hate to be... Uh, Debbie Downer, but I think they've just had a lucky few games. I mean, I think Burns and Davis could both be great, but I think they're still rookies. I mean, obviously they're rookies, but what I mean by that is they're they're still learning. Burns was drafted raw. I think we've said that several times in this podcast, and he I don't think he's developed yet. I don't think he could develop that in one season, which I don't expect him to. I don't think they're superpower yet. I think <laughs> next year or maybe even the year after when. Burns and Davis are seasoned a little bit. I, I would say they would be. They're going to be a strength in the future. Not right now, though. I I agree with you in the the sense that they only they can only get better. At least the the two rookies. Uh, I 
I think that already I think that we've seen Artie Burns and Sean Davis grow already as players, and I think I don't know if they're Artie Burns is not a number one corner at this point. I don't think he will be by season's end, but I think it's maybe I don't think they've become a strength of the defense, but I think they've become maybe less of a glaring weakness. Maybe they've gone from <clears throat> oh, what's a what's a good analogy for this? Maybe they've gone from moldy Swiss cheese to just Swiss cheese. If 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 I mean maybe I'm crapping on the on them a little too much, but I uh, I don't know. They they also I don't know. Maybe I should give them a little more credit because of the wide receiving core they just faced. But I can't ignore the fact that the two of the last three weeks have come against Scott Tolzien and the Cleveland Browns. Um. I'm not sure if next week is going to do much to change my mind on it either because they're playing the Buffalo Bills, the number one rushing team in football. They're not exactly known to be throwing the ball well. So uh, I don't think it's – I think the jury's still going to be out on the secondary. On the other hand, the jury's <laughs> – the jury is not exactly out on the uh, defensive line. The Steelers have played well against the run this year except for when they played a top ten rushing team. That's happened four times this year. All four, te- all four times they've been gashed. And uh, Buffalo runs better than any other team. Are you concerned about that? Oh, my God. I'm not scared of LaShawn McC- McCoy. More so than I'm scared of Tyrod Taylor getting out of the pocket and just running all over the Steelers. Because Tyrod Taylor is actually averaging the most yards per carry on that team and when he gets out of the pocket he is fast he is so fast I mean of course LaShawn McCoy is, is a scary guy I, I would say he's having a really good year but uh, the, the way the Steelers play I am I'm so scared of just the one time the Steelers get a pass rush on on, on the Bills he's just gonna roll out and he's gonna run for like 30 yards down the field I think the Steelers are going to need to... I'm sorry, I, I just interrupted you. Go ahead. No, it's okay. I just think Tyrod is the most versatile... Uh, agile. Agile is a better word. Agile quarterback in the league right now. Not Russell Wilson, not anyone else. Colin Kaepernick. He is the most vers- uh, agile. And uh, I think that's scary. What do you think? I uh, I agree with you. Uh, I think I don't know how the Steelers are going to stop him. We can look at it more uh, next week, or not next week, uh, this Friday, which is when our next episode is going to be. I think they're going to end up shadowing someone, whether it's Sean Davis. I don't think it should be an inside linebacker on him. Uh, But we can discuss that more later. Um, Just uh, one more quick note. We'll touch on it again uh, in our next episode. But, Austin, you are going to be traveling from Long Island up to Rochester, New York, to where I am, and we're uh, we're going to be going to the game next Sunday. Yeah, we're gonna go watch the Steelers take on the Bills live in person. <laughs> it'll be uh, it'll be a lot of fun. Obviously, that being the case, we're not gonna be able to live tweet the uh, game next week. So we hope you understand, but it's a uh, it's a nice experience, and we're looking forward to it. So uh, we hope you uh, are looking forward to our next episode and the game uh, as well. Is there anything else you want to add before we wrap things up today, Austin? All right. Well, thank you for joining us today. If you have any questions about the show or you have feedback to offer us, please email us at strongerthansteelpodcast at gmail.com. Uh, we're on a lot of social media sites. We're on SoundCloud, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. Our Twitter handle is STSPodcast1. Uh, Facebook, we're just Stronger Than Steel Podcast. Uh, give us a like. Um, as far as sound, as far we post our SoundCloud uh, episodes, Stronger Than Steel podcast, we post them on Facebook and YouTube, or not YouTube, Twitter, and we post our episodes to YouTube as well, Stronger Than Steel podcast. Uh, Austin, you have a great night, and uh, listeners, you have a great night as well. Uh, go Steelers. <laughs>